Racism, what is it? Simply put, it's the belief that one race is superior to another. But how big a problem is it? And what are the main factors contributing to racial tensions today? I'm on the streets of London, arguably the city with the most diverse range of cultures found anywhere on this planet, to see what, if anything, can be done to solve this incredible issue. Aziza Yaken, I'm from Croydon. And my name is Kenya, I've been living in London for the past 17 years. Hello, my name is Manpreet Singh, uh, I'm 29 years old and I've lived in the UK all my life. I'm Zach Sallows and I'm currently studying at University in London at the moment, in East London, so I'm living on campus at the moment. My name is Max, I'm from Hong Kong and I've been in England for like, what, yeah, two, three years roughly. So my name is Sophia. I'm from London and I'm currently working in HR. Uh, my name is uh, Abinan Abro and I'm from Africa's. I've been living in London since uh, 2001. I think racism to me is uh, a lack of education and perhaps understanding. And I think where people are scared of something different, to me it's a very primitive mindset. If something's different, you're kind of fearful of it maybe, or if you don't really understand it. So it's normally easier to mock it if it's different, as opposed to trying to, to learn and understand the why behind it. Racism comes in different forms in the sense that um, there's hidden racism, you could say, where um, certain barriers can't be breached just because of how things have been placed over time. For me personally, racism is discrimination or prejudice against a certain person based on their race and excluding them from certain spaces, conversations, areas. Mm, I guess it's just people being rude to people of a specific race. That's, that's as simple as I can boil it down to, really. Coming from quite a predominantly white background from the West Country, racism doesn't necessarily mean very much to me in terms of my upbringing. But coming then into a more diverse location like London, the last two years have been more of an eye opener in terms of what that diversity actually means to the whole sort of community of, of London. It doesn't necessarily mean very much to me in terms of the way it would affect me, but in terms of being more accepting of everybody and job roles as well. I think uh, racism for me is just is, is about. Uh, prejudice in somebody because of the colour of their skin or their race. Roach Inwood is the Chief Executive Officer of Kick It Out, a 26-year-old organisation that not only champions equality but also tackles discrimination in football, whether you play, support or work in it. For us in Kick It Out, we not only challenge racism, we challenge all forms of discrimination, so we look at sexual orientation, gender, faith as well. So. And that intersectionality that happens between all of those things is important to recognise as well. So we don't put it on its own. We, we understand it's an intrinsic part of, the, of society and an um, intrinsic part of what people define themselves as. Is racism on the increase? Well, despite the fact that the Americans abolished slavery in 1865, apartheid was abolished in 1994, the United Nations condemn racism in 1966, and indeed the European Union banned it in 2001. It is still around today. I think that racism is everywhere. It's, you can't, I can't measure whether it's on the rise or whether it's on a decline, um, but I can say that sentiment in England in particular, especially with Brexit going on, has created an atmosphere where people are seeing each other as us versus them. Streets. Streets. I think for me personally, and it's on the increase, and I think that's in society and I think that's in football as well because 
what we do, we, we work very closely with the police and we work with other organizations that tackle anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, sexism, and we see all of their statistics increasing like our statistics have increased. Now, people can ask you, is that because there's more discrimination or because people are more confident about reporting it? And in the last, up to the last couple of years, I would have said that was a difficult question for me to answer because there is an increase in the confidence about reporting. People report now things that maybe 10 years ago they wouldn't have. But for us in Kick It Out, we've seen the last two years there be significant increase in, in all forms of discrimination. Wouldn't really know because I live in like one spot and I usually never move from that one spot. I've had like a racist roommate. Every now and then they would like yell racial slurs at people when he's angry. I don't think it's because he's actually like hating against the race. He just finds the worst thing he can say to be angry. It's just him ranting basically. I don't necessarily think it is on the increase or even necessarily on the decrease. I think it's becoming more, people are becoming more aware of what we can do to battle it and make it less of a situation. In my opinion, I've, I've seen uh, a lot more education. So in terms of, so for myself, um, I'm a Sikh and there's a lot more education with regards to um, who the Sikhs are, what we represent, why we look the way we look. Um, so in my lifetime, I've seen a lot more increase in education, not just amongst Sikhs, but just around people in general. So I think that's helping. Um, obviously, it can become very topical in the news. Like, for example, recently with the England football game, which I was watching, and it was almost quite a... You Sometimes you're aware of situations like that, and they can happen, but when it does happen, it can almost raise quite a, quite a big eyebrow in terms of what can we do to affect it. I think it's just always been there in the sense that there's institutional racism still. Um, I think now obviously social media is becoming more and more apparent in terms of what happens in areas and places. So I think people are becoming more aware that it's happening um, as opposed to I say like back 10 years ago where we would call out racism if someone just called out someone in the street. I think um, there's a different way that people have um, learnt what racism can be now. So let's just talk, go through all these anti-racial groups. So probably at the top of the list uh, is the Ronnie Mead Trust. Last year was their 50th anniversary um, and I believe they were uh, set up um, or inspired by uh, Martin Luther King. Uh, it's headed by uh, Dr. Omar Khan. They are a race equality think tank because they not only are involved with network building, but also they are involved with government and policy decisions. So that's the Running Me Trust. The next one we contacted has been going for 25 years, and that's the Kick It Out campaign. Now, of course, they are uh, exclusively uh, promoting equality for anybody who watches, plays and works in football. They're anxious for various football organisations, whether it be professional, semi-professional or grassroots, to report any racist slurs on the pitch. So that's their modus operandi. Then we look at an organisation called FAIR, which stands for the Forum Against Islamophobia and racism. They were formed in 2001. All these organizations, by the way, are charities, so they rely on uh, donations. Now, therefore, promoting culturism across all races, uh, which is kind of interesting. So, yeah, all these organizations, they champion uh, equality, and uh, we shall see if we're able to get some information from them. I don't necessarily think they fuel the racist slurs, but I do think they fuel negative propaganda towards it in terms of um, the limelight of people's culture as such. Some people would argue that both the media and social media are to blame for racial tensions. Arguably, if TV crews didn't report on Islamic State, they won't be as famous as what they are. In 1994, the book 
the bell curve caught a controversy because it argued that white people or Caucasian people were more intelligent than the black community. And indeed, the National Association of Hispanic Journalists say that of every 12,000 news stories, only 1% pertain to Latinos. And of that, 80% of those stories are negative. In terms of the media, I would say perhaps not. I think there's more of an effort to include people um, from um, sort of diverse backgrounds. Um, I'm certainly seeing that there's a lot more inclusion, so I think that's helping to battle it. Um, if you look on TV, there's people from all walks of life, all different backgrounds, and it's becoming more representative of the world we live in. I don't think social media is to blame. I don't think I would challenge social media that there's much more for them to do um, because we see, because we're a reporting bureau, you can report any form of discrimination to us if you see it or hear it in a game. But we also pick up social media discrimination and what we see on that is much more virulent, much more targeted discrimination because of the anonymity of the people posting it. Now, we would challenge Twitter and Facebook and all the social media pr pr providers that they must do more to address that. And it's a complex issue, and I understand that, and you have to work with people like the CPS, the police as well. So we're trying to bring all of those bodies together with the football bodies to say, enough's enough now. And we've been, we've been reporting this for the last, I'd say five years anyway, but saying you have to take more of a stand Social media has to take more of a stand because there is just such an increase in it. Racism has always been there. You know, social media only brought it up. You don't understand? Before in the past, when things like this happened, because there were no social media, so things were like kind of people didn't know about it. You don't understand? Now with social media, every single thing is out there. So it's not because social media increases the problem but social media brought the problem to light. Yes, it's, I mean, it's created a whole um, polar polarisation in terms of some people are so extreme with their views and then you have people who are the complete opposite as well. So I think because people are hidden behind screens, they can talk about whatever they want because there's no face-to-face -face contact. So it makes it easier. In terms of social media, I think people are broadening their horizons. So with social media comes um, people blogging about travel and countries they've been to and um, uh, societies that they've lived with and what they've learned from and that, breeds it, that leads into the, the education side of things. You, you open your world up to really what's out there and personally I think it's broadening people's horizons. Social media is one of those difficult things because it's, it's, it's not very specific in terms of Instagram, for example, it doesn't matter what culture you're from. If anything, people are very excited about where you come from, what you do, how you experience your life and how you're presenting that to everybody. So I don't think there's any problems on social media in terms of uh, colour at all, or especially culture. I think they do. I think social media in itself fuels racial stereotypes of particular racial groups. For example, like black people like eating chicken or watermelon, right. or that white people wear chinos and loafers. These things are not necessarily the correct way of displaying or portraying races. I think we need to become more real about one another because at the end of the day we're all humans and we need to show that we're I'm the same as you you're the same as me I think that we shouldn't be we shouldn't be harsh on social media at we at least them they try to you know to put to our attention that there's a problem so people need to do something about it yeah that's that's how I say things If it's in society, it'll be in football. Football's not distinct from society. It just it reflects what's going on inside society. If you look at any, any home office or you look at police records, they'll tell you that there's a rise in hate crime throughout society. And football's just a reflection of that. However, for me, football's got an opportunity to lead. It could lead on this about how to tackle all forms of discrimination. And do I think that football is different now than it was 30 years ago, 20 years ago? Yes, I do. I don't think we're, we've got it solved now, but I think it's much better. If you ask uh, people who went to a game 25, 30 years ago and who go now, will they tell you significantly different? And they will tell you it's significantly different. 
apart from maybe grassroots? I think in terms of sport, um, because it's more publicised, we're seeing it in terms of a spotlight. So there's more of an increased spotlight towards it. So we think that there's a lot of racism that happens in sport, but I think it's in all different areas and all different industries. I mean, you can experience uh, racism just by walking down a path, or you can do it when you're running 100 metres on a race and you won and then people say, oh, he cheated, or um, he's actually, she's actually a man, you know, there's just the different things like that. I think it's kind of, it is kind of quite general, I guess. I think as a like, black person living in England, I don't think you can really escape it, no matter where you are in life. I think racism is prevalent in all walks of life and especially heightened in places where you're in a minority. I think that when you're one of a few, many people don't really understand where you're coming from because they've never been in your shoes, they've never experienced your experiences. Um, but I think in sports it's heightened even more because of the fact that you're on a platform that is exposed, you're, gi you're giving yourself exposure to a lot of eyes and these eyes may ne not necessarily be used to seeing you in these areas. So for example in football, um, I saw like the other day there was a, a man, I can't remember his name, but he was a famous footballer and they were calling him a monkey after he s scored a goal. I think things like that kind of show how much racism has kind of permeated the norm and made it like the norm to just target people from minorities. It's everywhere really, but in like competitive things in general, people just get more angry and vitriolic, you know? Like they just be more loud about just being angry the other side. It doesn't have to be like a race or whatever, they're just angry. Do these security services, and in particular the police, unfairly target ethnic minorities? Well, in the United Kingdom, 60% of British African citizens have been abused on at least one occasion. And in 1998, in the United States, of 4,468 crimes reported to the police, 2,901 came from African Americans. I don't think the stop and search will ever be phased out, but I think that more police being visible on the streets is a good thing. I think even better, more ethnic minorities within the police force is amazing because it means that even if stop and search does continue on, ethnic minorities may be more trusting of the police and may not think that there's an ulterior motive going on or, like I said before, an us versus them narrative that kind of permeates media. I mean, I always think when I'm reading the papers on the tube that why is it that every week, even though stop and search continues, why is it that we keep getting young black men dying from stabbings and things like that? I think if there were more ethnic minority policemen visible on the streets, it won't solve all, but it would do a great way in bridging the gap between the us versus them. Well, you're asking a Catholic from Northern Ireland, so I would have a view on that now. Um, I don't really think the stop and search is a, is a terribly effective mechanism. It wasn't effective, I don't think, in Northern Ireland, and I don't think it's been terribly effective here either. Um, I recognise the police have a hard job. I worked for the Met for a while. I recognise that, but I think for me, it's much more about the police understanding the local communities they serve and that for them to be reflective of the local communities they serve. Um, because that local intelligence, that trust in the police can only be built by a lot of hard groundwork and that takes time. And things like the Safer Neighbourhoods initiatives and community policing, it takes time to build up that trust from communities that have maybe have historically not engaged with the police. Um, and I know that from growing up myself in Northern Ireland, that uh, you know, would, would, would we have engaged with the police? Would I have engaged with the police when I was growing up? No, I wouldn't have done. You know, so it takes, it takes challenge to ourselves and the police to need to com completely always be challenged themselves is how do we have communities, how do we increase the trust the communities have in us? I think there's two sides to the coin. I get the side from the people that are affected, let's just take stop and search for example. I get how someone could be upset by being stopped and searched because they look a certain way and I can get how they could be upset. But then if you look on the flip side of things, the police, the people that are carrying these stop and searches out, 
they are doing it for our safety, for the safety of the public. Now, if statistics show that there are certain minorities committing more, let's just say, knife crime than other minorities, then I think the police are well within their right to look at those minorities and try to, not just those minorities obviously, but if the stats back them up, then they're well within their right to stop and search those people because they're just trying to do their job. And I think everyone just needs to be a bit more understanding of why these things exist and just trying to be a bit more cooperative. If, if I was stopped and searched, my first reaction wouldn't be to react in a negative way and go on the defensive about why I'm being stopped. These people are just out there to do their job. They're just trying to make our streets safer and if I can help them do that and make, make their life a bit easier, then I will do. I do understand that and I see that. Um, I mean, I work in court. So going into court, there's a difference if um, it's just a person of colour. Sometimes you see that um, security cars will double check or when you're travelling on a flight, if the, um, the scanner beeps suddenly, they'll get randomly checked. Um, but I think um, it's just because media has publicised it so much that if it's a certain race, um, the race is immediately put out there. That it's this guy from this country and then everyone becomes aware of all oh, these kind of people start generalising, it's a bad thing. Not going to lie, it's, it's easier being a white man to go through security compared to a, a guy who's a person of colour, um, just because of the connotations of it, really. Um, and I've, I've witnessed it myself in terms of things. I mean, my dad, <laughs> I see it, um, and my mum. So I, I guess that's just how it is. Yeah, I've been like stopping search like a few times, like a handful of times, and um, yeah, obviously they, I think they do like, I think they do just yeah they do any black people that would stop and search them. I've been stopping searched even in LSC, which is like a high middle class place. I've been stopping searched there. You hear quite a lot of America's problems and the sort of stereotypical way in which they treat black people when it comes to crime and how they would treat white people differently to how they treat black people but like I said it's one of those things that you possibly you wouldn't understand fully until it, you, you're over there to experience it or see it for yourself. I think from personal experience I've dealt with the police in my own personal settings due to some issues I won't go into and the way that I've been treated by the police has not been any different from the way I've seen them treat any other race. I think that the police are doing a good job in trying to be more pragmatic in the way they kind of treat everyone. I, but I hear things about the stop and search and I, can't, I cannot say that it's not racist because the very nature of it from the beginning was racial. Um, the sus laws that came out that kind of stopped and searched black individuals back in the 1960s have still not been removed from the policies that are going on right now. So I can't say that they're not racist, but I know that they are doing a lot to treat people, everyone, the same. Okay, I've read a lot of story about this. Even this uh, singer Jamilia, I don't know if you know her. Yeah, she said that she was uh, stopped by police. Why she, 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 I mean, for her, she didn't do anything wrong. So things like this, I heard a lot in a news in a in a newspaper and uh, in a, on TV that you know there's a certain of um, you know black and Asian and people they they get stopped by police um, only okay I won't say for the sake of it but compared to you know other you know you know white people they get stopped way 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 too much don't understand so I think as far as I'm concerned, I remember once I was going home, it was like 3 a.m. in the morning, and then there was a police car behind me I didn't know. When I turned back and then I saw the police car, so they were asking me if, if I was living around. I said, yes, I live around, this is my house. I said, okay, if your house, so try to open the door. And then I got my key out, I opened the door, and then they knew that, okay, then I was, that was really my house. And then uh, they, they left. So personally, I didn't experience any, you know, any racism things, to be honest with you. But I've, I've read a lot in the newspaper and on TV. I've seen a, a lot of things, hear stories. So, yeah, that's what I can say. I think the Met, like most police forces, recognise now that they have to have a diverse workforce, that they have to have, if you're going to have that trust, they can't, you know, Northern Ireland came through it as well to make sure that there's much, there's many more Catholics come into the PSNI. 
because of that disconnect with the Catholic community and the nationalist community. So I would imagine that most police forces would have to, would recognise that and want to make sure that their workforce is diverse as possible so that they can have the maximum impact on what they're doing. Some people would argue that the colour of one's skin can affect one's career and job prospects. While worldwide employers are supposed to abide by anti-racial laws, in the US, Austell, who build ships for the Navy, refused to acknowledge responsibility for racial slurs aimed at one of their employees, Ron Law, and indeed the US bank JP Morgan had to pay out $19.5 million to six of their employees to avoid a discrimination case. In the UK, the Independent reported that at least 25% of the UK workforce has been subjected to some form of discrimination. Initially, when people interview you and they maybe see your CV and they see your first name and it's an English name and they see your second name and they don't quite know where it's coming from, that can be a little bit of a barrier because the person doesn't necessarily trust you. They may have unconscious bias going on in the sense that they may not know who you are, what background you're coming from. But I think in the workplace in particular, um, I don't think it's a barrier. I mean, your work is your work and what you do should definitely represent who you are and your work ethic and your education and your background and the sort of things that you know how to do your job. So I don't think that racism is a barrier in the workplace, but getting into the workplace and into certain spaces, it may be a barrier. The subject that I'm looking to more go into is more property development and architecture, so, um, which has always mainly been quite almost a, a white person's background. It's been very upper class. So now they are making almost huge steps in terms of how can we integrate everybody regardless of their backgrounds, their cultures, their skin colour. I've worked in football for 10 years now. And I think if you look at football as a career, as an industry, you if you look at the diversity at the entry level, it's getting much better. But if you progress up through football, you won't see that diversity. You certainly won't see it from a colour point of view and you won't see it from a gender point of view or a disability or a sexual orientation, as much as you can tell. But what, and you look at the boardrooms, like I, I spent a lot of time travelling around a lot of football clubs, you, won't, you will not see that diversity there. So what's stopping? And also if you look at you know, the constant debate we have about the lack of black managers in the game, if you compare it to the fact that 32% of players are from a, an ethnic minority background, and you've got what, three, four black managers in the game, coaches. If you go into an academy, you won't see that diversity in the academy system. In regard to the staffing of an academy, you'll see it in the diversity of the young players, but you won't see it there. So you'd have to say, what's the, where's, what's the breakdown that you can leap from here to there? Because most, a lot of coaches and managers are ex-players. So from that point of view, I think that you, there is definitely an issue. And we run a mentoring leadership programme to try and get young, diverse people into the business of football because it can be quite a closed industry. It's quite, it can be just, and it's difficult to navigate around it as well. Um, and you know, my team are very diverse. I'm very lucky that way. And um, they will tell you that many of them have been racially abused, um, both at grassroots level and going about their daily work. And also there's that sort of hidden discrimination that nobody really talks about where they may not be openly saying something to you, but you know what they're doing and that unconscious bias around that. Actually, no, I don't. I think there is a problem with promotion. I think, especially in the financial sector, I've heard from my friends who work there that they get pigeonholed. So they rise up into a certain level, mid managerial positions. Um, they never get to that director level, even though they have the same experience, even more than their white or Asian or Indian counterparts. So I think that in terms of racism, it's something that needs to be kind of looked at. Why is it that so many people on board level are not representative of the population that we live in? Why is it that there's only certain 
types of people in senior management or senior positions? It's not something that I've um, suffered from myself, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. I work in the construction industry, um, so things such as going to site and being able not to wear a hard hat, for example, because practicing Sikhs are protected by law in order to do so. Um, so I'm very different compared to, I guess, the majority of people who work in the construction industry, but that I don't feel like that's affected my personal prospects with regards to getting a job. I think I've been quite lucky in a sense of working in an office environment. It wasn't big. I didn't really grow up thinking, oh, the colour of my skin is going to affect how I'm going to get job prospects. But I do understand that there are certain barriers that some people, I mean, it depends on your experience, I guess. Growing up in a community where um, the colour of your skin had an impact in terms of what you had in terms of access to things. So um, would make a difference on how you would then view, oh, what can I access? Um, will I actually be able to step foot in terms of certain places um, because I feel like I'm not welcome there or I'm not? Um, in terms of, for me, I think I haven't really felt like, oh, I can't um, go to step foot in an office just because of my skin. I mean, I, can't, I can only speak for myself, really. The only thing that I can say is, they have to try to be fair a bit, to understand. Um, if, for instance, you want to promote someone, you need to, you know, he has to be based on their uh, experience and their skill, to understand before promoting. Because if you promote some, somebody because uh, you know that he's not up to the job, or you try to favor him compared to somebody who has more skill, it's uh, it's not fair and uh, it's not right. We have it, and we've got the Equality Act, mm -hmm. and we have the protected characteristics, we have positive action, so we have all of those things that are in place that have been in place for quite a while. Um, to me it's about also the employer, you know, um, how do you make sure that the opportunities you're offering are you're offering to a diverse set of people, how do you build um, diversity into your business, not as a tick box exercise, but how do you make it a core element of every single bit of your business so you don't think about it anymore, it's just central to what you do because the research will show you a diverse team is usually much more productive, much more creative, part of your organisation. So how do you make sure, how do you make sure you have more women, how do you get make sure that as you go up the ranks of any sort of business that there's opportunities for um, underrepresented people in your business to get to where they fulfil their potential because then make sure that your board is diverse because if you don't have it from the top it doesn't come down. So you must have equality champions at that level for it to have an impact all throughout your business. So I think it's very much down to the employers. Um, I have like, not often though, like maybe it's like twice or someone's explicitly you know, called me like not the n-word essentially. Right. But yeah, I think that's quite rare, I think nowadays, definitely in like, kind of my generation. So yeah, I'd say it's quite rare. Last year, whilst playing for the university football team, um, obviously from London is quite a definitely a mixed race team and um, the, one of the players unfortunately was in a situation in which he was racistly slurred towards and it, it became more of a difficult situation in which it was handled because obviously when it comes from the sort of lower level whether it's just university football whether or not it's that level or even up to the England standard it's still the same procedures that have to go by but it felt for us as if it had got slipped between the fingers a little bit of the people of obviously hierarchy that have to deal with those situations and possibly then it goes back to what you're saying about then the media. Yeah, I mean I went to uni up north so um, very different in terms of I mean cultural differences you could say and um, I did geography in uni so it was mainly um, white people you could say. Um, so in a classroom there was about 10 people of colour out of 400 kids on the course. So I guess that's very different. Um, a lot of people would ask if I was an international student in the beginning. 
but I mean, you, you can't really blame them. I think it, you have to assess it based on the situation. Because some people, I mean, you know, it's harmless, I guess you could say. And others, you know when people are trying to do it in like the wrong way. My wife is from Poland, and uh, the first time she said to her mom that she's gonna do her life with a black man, she didn't like it. She even uh, asked her to stop it, but she has to, you know, she said no. And uh, it wasn't easy on her. It wasn't easy on her. With time, I mean, she wasn't talking with her mom so so much because of this. And uh, when we had our first child, her mom has to maybe try to calm down a bit. And uh, so far, things tend to be a bit normal, don't understand. And I've been to Poland as well, and but I didn't meet her mom because she was living far from the town. But people were looking looking at me a lot. I remember one day we went to a restaurant, but people were looking at me a lot. But you know, I guess this kind of normal. To be, I was a bit scared, yeah, because of uh, the the way people were looking at me. So even my even my wife as well, she was a bit scared. She even told me that we would never go live in Poland because of the you know because of the rate of racism is way 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 too much compared to UK. So. Yeah, I was okay, but at, at the same time, no scares, like, uh, you know, some, somebody will attack me, but I was, uh, you know, trying to, <laughs> to say, okay, what's going to, what's going to happen, because it was my first time in Poland. But, you know, at the end, it was okay. Does racism pervade all walks of life, or is it just in certain industries, such as sport, where the problem lies? Just talking about sport, even non-contact sports like golf, Tiger Woods, who is arguably one of the world's greatest ever golfers, has reported racial discrimination in his time. England's Euro 2020 qualifying match against Bulgaria and Sofia was overshadowed by racism from home fans. As a result, the referee stopped play twice in the first half. I mean, again, the England-Bulgaria game set precedent as well because they evoked the UEFA three-step protocol um, and even though they didn't get to stage three or well, they got to sort of stage two um, and we have to commend Gareth Southgate and the players for the way that they conducted themselves the dignity they did but my point is different than that because I don't think it should be down to them to have to call that I think it's down it's a UEFA league UEFA knew there was going to be we all knew there was going to be a problem with England Bulgaria you know, so all my team are watching it, almost drafting statements as it's going out. So if you know there's a problem, and Tyrone Minx was, was warming up, they heard, he heard monkey chanting. Now if he heard it and he's pitched, the UEFA officials heard it. So if the UEFA officials heard it, why did they not stop the game before it started? Or why did they not make that decision? Why it shouldn't be down to Gareth Southgate and his players, and that we're absolutely total fans of what he did, but it shouldn't be down, it should be down to UEFA. And when the subsequent ban and sanction that they give in Bulgaria, I don't think are good enough. You know, a two-match ban, one suspended, and 75,000 euro fine. What is the point of that? Or how are you going to educate those fans? And not all Bulgarian fans are like that. But again, when you see those guys come in, I think you'd, anybody would have been not, not naive not to know what they were there for. You know, it was clear, and they walked out, and that there was no sanction. Now my question is why, why is that? And if you knew these guys were connected to a far right group, which they seem to have done, why let them into the stadium in the first place? Harringay, which was only four or five days later than the, uh, the game between England and Bulgaria, they actually took the bull by the horns and walked off the pitch, uh, suspended the game, because of racial taunts to some of their players? Well, <laughs> much as I'd love to get into the mind of a, of a racist football fan, it's a difficult one for me to answer. I, I, my personal view is no. And the reason why I think that is, is because the worst thing you can do to a football fan is take away their ticket, take away their season ticket. That's the worst punishment you can give a football fan. So. I don't know why they do it. I think sometimes there's lots of different reasons why. You can sometimes get carried away in the crowd. You can think that things that you may not say in the workplace that football is allowed. Well, I'm not in the workplace where I can say it. There's a certain anonymity of being in the large crowd. 
Um, but I don't know if I think that it's down to 15 minutes of fame. I think that, um, I mean, we do fans education. We do a rehabilitative work with fans who've been found guilty of discrimination. And the reasons why they do it are varied, to be honest. You know, we'll have always said it. Or I didn't know it was being, I didn't know it was being discriminatory. And I'm always a bit dubious about that in this day and age. But, um, or somebody else was saying it. So you have to try to find out the reasons behind, behind why people think that it's acceptable to go watch football and be discriminatory. Because often they'll say something in a football stadium or online that they would never say anywhere else. Can the government do more and what can they do? Well, some people would argue that judicial systems are corrupt. For example, in the United States, 33% of African Americans are detained before trial and 10% receive longer sentences for the same crime than their white counterparts. I think for me it's always down to two things. It's down to education and it's down to sanction. And it's the, the juxtaposition between those two things. I think for, for me personally I'm much more interested in how we educate how we empower fans. Because if you think about a game and say you have 40,000 fans at a game, it's usually one or two that are the people that are shouting that. You've got another 39,500 fans who don't really want this in the game. And so how do, we, how do we stimulate, empower them and educate them to challenge the two or three of their fans? And that's, that's coming more into football now than I've seen before. And that's that self-policing, which is brilliant. And I think one of the most powerful things to do, and also for young people, I think, you know, I, I'm no interested in criminalising young people, I'm much more interested in educating them, for them to become peer educators themselves. But for where there's persistent, prolific offending, then you need sanctions that make a difference, sanctions that will actually have an impact on, on, on the person or the club or the country or the FA, whatever it is. And that, so you need to make sure that those are appropriate but my first protocol always is education. I think then it goes alongside with the media as well. I think they need to almost work alongside each other to, to not highlight, well, no, to highlight issues, but not to prioritise different issues over issues. If it's a racism issue, it all gets highlighted. And I think if you can get rid of those blurred lines of what is racist and what isn't racist, you can then start to target the issue completely. In terms of racism, I don't think you can ever really kick it out. It's, in, it's just something I think, I wouldn't say innate, but it's just society and how it works. Some generations will be much worse, other generations maybe not. The Quality and Human Rights Commission regularly monitors whether UK society is adhering to the 2010 Equality Act and recently published their findings on racial discrimination within higher education. Now while 24% of ethnic minority students had witnessed some form of discrimination since the start of their course, there were only 559 reported cases of discrimination across 159 universities over a three and a half year period. I think we've got all the laws in place. I think it's just more of societal attitudes, really. I mean, I feel like everyone knows that you're not really supposed to say these things, you're not supposed to do that, or you're not meant to act in a certain way towards certain people. Um, it's just how people um, see things nowadays. There's no one way to report, you know, so, and we wouldn't say that she'd only report through us, so you should report to the police if you feel comfortable. You should report to Stuart if you feel comfortable. You should report to us. You should report to the club. You should report to the FA. It doesn't matter how you report. It's that you should report, and that's, that's the most important thing. And then the second most important thing is once you report, how is that dealt with? Because what you don't want is somebody who's been a victim of discrimination being re-victimised by the process. So there has to be a process where, be that a club, a police or the FA, make sure that reports dealt with quickly, transparently, and that you feed back to the victim. Because what has happened in the past, people would tell us, is that we've reported something and nothing's happened. And so therefore, you now have a very disillusioned person who will tell everybody they know not to report. Because, they've, they've, because it takes courage to report. 
It does, you know, especially if you're in a football ground, you're surrounded by a large set of people and there's maybe three guys over there who are using discriminatory language. It's a brave person who goes, it's those three. You know, that doesn't really happen, which is why we built the app, because the, the app is quite discreet. It's quite confidential. You can be anonymous if you want. And it's the ability for people to use that app to maybe who are not confident. And I include myself, and I'm not sure I would go up and tackle to two big six, six foot guys to be able to tackle that. So it's a different, you have to always have that, me, that sort of menu of how to report because one way it doesn't fit all. You know, and you know, you may not you may not be comfortable reporting to the police. You may not be able to find a police officer to report to, and so therefore the point you're making is is a young, technically savvy people not necessarily because we say you can also phone us or you can email us or you know there are lots of different ways to report. Well, I think. Well, like you said, it's one group thinks one thing, one think one group thinks another, and I think maybe we we should be as more of a public number, emphasise to them that there shouldn't be one thought against another. It should be all equal in terms of what racist ideas are racist and how we can completely tackle it completely. So obviously, like I said, my knowledge isn't brilliant in terms of that, but from what I can see from the outset, there's too much me against you at the moment and there should be a, almost a level field in which we should all say this isn't right we should now be looking to target this as a group regardless if you're coming with our group or with that group and I know it sounds quite pessimistic but I think that the government needs to have a complete change of mindset towards the communities that it wants to help I know they are trying their best in the news to target underprivileged, underdeprived areas, they're doing the best they can to engage the youth, but I feel like there just needs to be a bit more concerted effort to try and understand the people who they're trying to serve um, and not just use it as an initiative to win elections or something like that. I think it's it's got to start from the ground up, you know, things like racism are embedded into society and people have they don't know anything else. They're, they've grown up in a sort of racist environment, so to look at another person that looks differently to them negatively is just the norm. So I think what the government could do is target more children in schools, perhaps, and give more education, coming back to that, and more understanding about the, the different types of people that are out there, because it's, it's not only helping in one group of children understand that there's people different to them, it's helping those children that are different to their fellow students understand that actually it's okay. It's okay for me to look the way I look. It's okay to be different. And I think if we really target the children, then we could really see a big difference in, in racism in the coming years, fingers crossed. We're in a very difficult time because of Brexit. I think there's a lot of very left, right-wing rhetoric that's moved that's in the middle now, and I hear things that I haven't heard for a long time. <laughs> Recently, I got told to go back to where I come from, and I come from Northern Ireland, which is part of the UK, so not quite sure where I'd be going back to, um, to be honest. Um, and one of our staff is, is, is half French, and she got told the same thing. There's a lot of go back to where you come from going on, and I think we will probably more than likely move into a recession I think and with that comes the challenges that every recession brings which is uh, there's someone that has to be blamed for that and so politicians don't understand that by now and I don't think some of them do it lends itself to being to being sort of a rise in that idea of you know anti-immigration and anti you know sort of quite right-wing views which I find personally quite worrying African Americans, they definitely in America they can be seen as sort of immigrants that are chasing jobs and that a lot of white Americans feel like they shouldn't be there. And I feel like America at the moment is one of the biggest places for sort of white supremacist racism. So that's the first that comes to mind with me. And if anything, that's the biggest group that can get targeted. If you look at travelers tend to be still be very much an excluded group. We've done some work with travellers. 
um, both Roma and Gypsy, and they seem to be really probably one of the most excluded shun groups that I've ever worked with. But I think, unfortunately, it just seems to be that there's an awful lot of hate out there at the moment, you know, towards we see a, we've seen a rise in anti-Semitism, we've seen a rise in Islamophobia, we've seen a rise in racism, um, and that's just our own statistics. So unfortunately, I think that there is, and actually what I've seen in the last two years, which I haven't seen it since I've been in England, is there's, there's a real anti-Irish feeling going on as well, which I've never seen before. It's sort of slightly strange. And on always there was the homophobia, biphobia and transphobia. So unfortunately, I think there is still so much education to do and there's still, and the only way that we can do anything as a small charity that we are, is to try and bring together all the different bodies together and say, this impacts us all, whether you're a club, a county FA, a grassroots organisation, a player, a referee or a fan, how can we work together? What can we do together that's gonna to make sure that the game that we all love, and I'm a fan, is, right at the forefront of leading the fight against not just racism but all forms of discrimination. I think all ethnic minority groups get sick at racism. I think racism is not just about people being prejudiced towards you, like I said in the beginning it is that, but it's a lot more than that. It's people when you sit on the train, they kind of don't smile when you smile back. It's like when you're it's like when you introduce yourself to someone who is different from you and they ask you where do you come from, but no, where do you really come from? It's things, it's everyday things that, microaggressions that people have towards you because you're different to them. It's the questioning of who you are because of the fact that you look different, maybe even if it's skin tone. I think Islamophobia is a is something that is being combated in Britain. I think it's very difficult because you're talking about different aspects, let's just say uh, beliefs or religious beliefs for example. Um, take Sikhs for example where by law allowed to wear, um, they, we call it a kirban, which is like a, a, a item of, it's, it's a religious article essentially, but it is a bladed weapon. Um, and that's written into the British Constitution, it's written into law that we are allowed to carry such weapons because of the significance and the moral code of conduct that comes with it and, and the purpose as to why. Um, with regards to other you know, ethnic groups and ethnic minorities, it's hard for me to answer because I can't think of an example whereby I've seen one get treated a bit more fairly than the other, if that makes sense. If you want someone to respect you you need to respect yourself first that is sin. and the, the Jewish people is because maybe they have um, I would say successful community and the Asian community as well they are kind of successful but we are we are not that successful that is sin. and sometimes our behavior let people think that we are that is I mean they don't respect us sometimes because of what we do I have to be honest because of what we do, the way that we conduct ourselves in our society, the way we dress, the way we do things as well. So people tend to remember what they see, to understand. So I don't think because they favor other community, but I think that other community are more successful. So we have to try to work a bit harder, harder to, to fix our image, because as well, this as well can impact. In terms of terrorism and situations like that, people are very quick to use sort of history as their example for their stereotype, like the 9-11 events and, and the London bombings and things like that. So I think it's very much down to what people can grasp quickly to use against other people and that almost creates that instant stereo. Like stereo. I, I wouldn't want to say you know racism is more is, is, needs more money than homophobia does or anti-Semitism is not as important as Islamophobia. I think to me it, it, it's not about the type of discrimination. It's is there more resources needed to be to how we tackle it? So should there be better steward training? Yeah, there should be better steward training. Should there be greater support and training for referees? Absolutely. Should we make sure that all players? that come up through the academy system and are make sure that they know 
one, what discrimination, to, and two, if they are victim of it, how to report it. Do I think there should be more resources given to grassroots? Every single day I think that. There should be more given to grassroots to make sure that when you want to take your son out to play or your daughter out to play, that you're not going to hear that. So to me it's not the type of discrimination, it's more resources need to put against how you tackle that type. So is the UK a racist country? Our findings would suggest it is a country irrespective of creed, religion, and even sexual orientation, we generally get on with each other. As a country, we recognise we have some work to do, but the content of this programme suggests we're getting there.